activities that you might be celebrating today. Uh, today, we would like to welcome Mr. Rananjay Singh with us. Uh, he is a Chicago based architect, urban designer, educator who has been passionate about photography since his you know, very young days. He is uh, the principal architect at Jai Architecture and Interiors and also a guest lecturer at Central University of Rajasthan. Welcome, Rananjay. Thank you for accepting uh, the proposal for a Vartha with us. And we're looking forward to the session. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you once again, uh, IACD and Director Ma'am. And, so, uh, and of course, you, uh, Swati Ma'am, as well. I'm, I'm excited. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here on a holiday morning. I know it can't be easy for all of us, but uh, once again, uh, Eid Mubarak and whatever festivities might be relevant. And I'm excited as well. Thank you. Yeah. So we have a lot of students in the audience you know, who are excited to know, learn from your experience. So uh, just tell us something about more about yourself and uh, how the passion for photography developed and how it has transcended from you know, areas of Rajasthan to Chicago. Uh, well, I mean, photography came quite naturally to begin with. Uh, my father was uh, an avid photographer and he's always had his camera wherever he goes and he's always shown me how cameras work from an extremely young age. But uh, more than that, I believe it was his work which allowed him to, you know, travel to multiple locations within the country and then abroad as well. Uh, which really made me sort of notice the differences, subtle differences, or even the stark differences between different settings, time, light, and all of that, which really, you know, intrigued me into picking up the camera as well. But uh, to tell you a little bit about myself, which will hopefully connect to why I chose photography, uh, I am from Jaipur. Uh, it's a beautiful city, as obviously we know there's so much of art and so much inspiration all around us, so many details to look at, so much happening constantly. Uh, in any Indian given context, you have a lot happening anyway, but uh, yeah, so uh, because of my father, I got to live in different sorts of cities from Jaipur to Jaisalmer to Bikaner to Delhi, Frankfurt in Germany, and then now I'm here. So I could always see the different contexts and settings. And my education background, which is architecture, obviously, uh, sort of helped me uh, look into those details at a technical level, which, uh, you know, uh, started from the very smallest of, you know, doors and window details. Like, for example, Hava Mel is a cliche we use too often, uh, all the way to urban scale, which is what my master's was. I recently in Chicago did my master's in urban design which has helped me sort of broaden my perspective to a larger audience and larger scale, which, uh, and photography for me has like tied all of it together, you know, because that's one tangible way to be able to capture all of it and simplify things. Because as designers, we're trained to be, you know, good communicators through our artworks, but it can all often turn out to be the opposite because we have so much happening in our heads and photography sort of helps me simplify it into you know single or just a few relevant uh, details that can come up so yeah that's uh, pretty much it from mine so yeah i studied from uh, in ajmer uh, in mayo and then i went to architecture college in bhopal again a different context and setting and then i came for my masters in chicago which was in urban design very interesting and so how do you think when you pursued architecture, how did photography, you know, help you or how did you combine the two aspects to take it further? Uh, that's a very relevant question. And that's where uh, it usually comes to why photography is extremely important, even if you don't passionately do it or it's not part of your direct uh, aesthetic or design, uh, you know, setting or stage or however you work, I think uh, photography can really help you be responsive, firstly, because there is so much happening constantly around the world. And uh, it's a saying that, you know, as humans, we are more ignorant than we are smart, because it's tough to not be that there is so much happening all around the world. Like, even right now, 
because of COVID, because of, you know, Israel, Palestine, and there's so many issues, so much happening throughout the world all the time. And it's, it's really important to be responsive to your surroundings and your settings. Uh, and at the same time, designers and architects know this feeling all too well. When we're trained as designers, we're constantly judging everything around us. If you if you're sitting in a room, you'll be like, why is this color, the wall white? Or why is it off white? Why is it not white? Why is this material this? Why is it not different? Why is the color this? So we're constantly judging everything around us. And that becomes very challenging and almost exhausting in a lot of ways. So I felt photography was one medium that helped me be mindful and be responsive to my surrounding in a different way. Because as architect, I'm even if it's not my building, my project has nothing to do with me. I'm constantly in my head, changing things, wishing things were different or thinking of different alternatives. So firstly, I would say that it makes you, photography can help you be aware of your surrounding and uh, be responsive and mindful, as I said. And uh, another important aspect that comes through it is habituation. Uh, because uh, photography is something that your eyes are constantly doing in some sense. You don't necessarily always need a camera to understand and, you know, see how that process happens in photography because we're all trained. However old you are, you are somewhat trained in the principles of photography and you are doing it in some essence. That's why I feel uh, photography is easier to do compared to some other art forms. But that doesn't mean obviously that it's completely easy and everybody can just pick it up and do it essay, but of course there's principles, but mainly, so firstly was responsive. The second thing that comes is habituation, I would say. As designers, uh, habituation is the worst thing that can happen to us. Uh, every semester we start thinking, okay, this semester we're going to do amazing and we're going to have the best design. But as habituation kicks in, you are less responsive towards a lot of things, uh, including, you know, if you take talk about a design project, uh, you start with a lot of passion, but by that time, by the end uh, stages, you sort of give up on a lot of things and you go like, okay, whatever presentation ho jai, ya client dekh lega, teacher dekh lega. So habituation is something that really makes us less uh, effective uh, as time goes and design is a longer process. So I felt like thinking about photography in, uh, you know, as a designer, when we're creating something, even when I start something, I'm thinking about the last stage of how I would capture it. Right. So I'm constantly connected and thinking about the last stage. So I don't sort of, you know, get a little laid back in the end. And this is something that my father tells me a lot. He uses it for as Rajputs because he says that, you know, in a hundred meter race, we like to run the first 90 meters extremely fast and we're, you know, ahead in a lot of things. But then in the last 10 meters, we like, okay, 90 meter bhaagli hai, okay, baaki kya hota hai. Design is the same. You know, when we start a project, we, the first 90 meters, we work passionately, we work hard, but then things can get so exhausting, so taxing. Teacher might not agree with your design. Your client might not agree with your design. So photography sort of helps me into, you know, finding that last 10 meters of race to, you know, go really well, because I'm thinking about the marketability. I'm thinking about how it could be captured in a sense that uh, can, you know, elevate the design in some sense. And sorry, this, if this answer is too long, but then I also feel uh, photography can, uh, sort of elevate your design thinking in a lot of ways. Because like I said, uh, as designers, we're constantly sort of judging and racing in our heads at everything we see. Another example, personal example that I like to use is as a child, when I was in the car with my parents, uh, my father would al always tell me, bhar dek, bhar dek, itti sari cheese, and I would be sleeping inside most of the times. But when I was looking outside, you see all those wires fleeting around you. Whenever I was looking outside, I would constantly count the number of poles going by. I would put characters on it, follow my eyes with wherever the wires were going. 
the demarcations in the road i would you know zip across them and there was so much happening as a child that i was always into two places at a time and of course sleeping is beautiful as well but uh, coming back to my point photography can really help you elevate your design thinking because uh, true uh, photography and other parallels of design even if you don't actively do them just being aware of them can help elevate your thinking uh, and can also help you in your profession uh, it's not just you know everyday matters and lastly i would say that uh, photography can is is a tool that can help you transcend your locality and at the same time immerse you into it as well because it might seem contradictory but uh, one famous example is that buddha uh, he once gave among the many uh, sermons that he gave to his uh, students one famous sermon was the silent sermon he gave where he just held a flower in his hand and uh, for hours he did not say anything and everybody was just looking at the flower and only one student then got up and he understood the objective of that you know uh, that sermon what what the point was now i don't claim to completely understand what the point was but if you look back thousands of years hundreds of years we've constantly humans have constantly been inspired by two things you know poets artists and everything even you all students we use these two things as our concepts in design or inspiration at some level firstly it's flowers something as simple as flowers or birds why is that because once humans step out of that utilitarian need that we have you know khana pani shelter once we step out of that the first thing that we realize is that is the beauty that surrounds us right so photography what can once again help you find that beauty around you even if you're being pulled down by your jury pulled down by your presentations pulled down by all sorts of stuff that designers go through photography i feel is one medium that can you know again elevate you and transcend you outside of your locality to to think to be able to think of a larger perspective but yeah but i said a lot of things no no thank you you know you have Makes really sense. mentioned very relevant points because we as designers completely understand the passion when we start the work which slowly fizzles out and towards the end you know we sort of you know sometime i think of compromising or sometime because of the deadline so many things come into our mind so you know for you it's photography that helps you push it further and i think very rightly right. you have said you know that it helps in marketing also because a design is often a utility product is for a utility product whether it be you know whatever garments products interior uh, accessories whatever so in that can sense when you talk about marketing how do you feel photography has further uh helped in the, uh, because you work with graphics also you are a ui ux designer as well so how do you think photography and then like you have you said you have been observing so many aspects while traveling the poles the roads you know all these things so the observation skill and then that has built up into photography and into graphics so how do you think that has further helped you with marketing or how you interact with your clients in that sense so i feel like uh, clarity as a designer comes from engagement and not thought because again we are always thinking and thinking and thinking and we expect the client or teacher to understand those things and this is a challenge that i face a lot and still do and uh, you know your client or the other end user always requires a tangible thing to be to look at and something that is simplified right so photography is again something that helps me at that level at the marketing because i have something physical to show to my clients to my users to my students to whatever and uh, photography in its essence really helps me simplify things as well so if i'll take the example of my interior design projects for example there is so much happening in any interior design project or even if you guys design a single product there's so many views that you would want to capture you would want to show everything that it has right but when it comes to interior photography taking this as an example i it sort of helps me to trickle down to the most relevant to the most detail oriented things that might be 
the most important to see amongst every millimeter of you know wall inch corner that i design uh so in term and also right now the kind of society that we are in photos are everywhere you know sadly the life of a photo now is not more than a second or two seconds taking the example of social media now you scrolling 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 even the best of photos the maximum time i guess anybody would spend on it would be 3 to 5 seconds if at all right so uh, photography comes as a medium that is easily approachable and uh, you know marketable because i can put up my photos and products of it on say you know like i can show you some stuff right now i can put it on instagram social media websites and all all, all that sort of stuff so i feel uh, photography can sort of has always helped me to trickle down to the finer details and have a sort of a you know directory that i can always relate to at the end and i don't know if you guys face this or not but by the end of a project when i'm nearing it i often reach a stage where i can't look at that project anymore that's why i do all these different kind of designs if i'm doing an architectural project i'm also doing a graphic design project with it i'm also doing ui ux or all sorts of other things that's because we a lot of problems come in like habituation is one and so many other things uh, so again photography sort of helps me to put all of them together in sort of one place and whenever i need to go back to a project photography is one way that i look back at it even if i'm doing renders and not uh, you know doing live shoots then i still use the same principles uh but yeah it's mainly how easy and approachable it is it helps you think about your end product and how you're going to market it that way you also think about all the angles and how you would design that product to have better photography or sort of execution or marketability uh and yeah of course it's it's a, mainly it's just how approachable it is yeah and uh, you know when we talk about clients and marketing and all those become the tangible aspects of photography and design what about the intangible aspects how do we evolve that and how do we go about that how matlab what is the process that you would like to follow uh, or is it something that just comes naturally it does start to come naturally uh, there's two things in this i would say and i would share an image here as well to be able to better explain it we often think that a lot of things come naturally but there's always some principles and some logic behind it right so first thing is i think it's important for designers to understand too that and this is something that design the design field is talking about a lot recently and there's a lot of podcasts about it why do we become designers of course there's that thing ki engineering nahi kar paya doctor nahi ban paya to we went into design or we didn't know better so we went into design but the thing is we believe that we have a taste you know we have an aesthetic that is better than people around you better in some sense you think you have a taste right and then when you have that taste you start doing things and initially when you start it's that taste that tells you whatever you did is completely horrible and that's why you pull yourself back here yeah, i have a good taste i think i can understand what a good sketch is but just because you understand what a good sketch is does mean that your sketch will be good in the beginning right so uh in the overall scheme of things the intangible aspect comes where uh you start making sense of what you're doing in the long term and where it fits in the larger circle of life uh as your institute the name icd itself is talking about i'm sure every all the students are told about the importance of conserving the you know old craft methods and craft details and sort of work that was done especially in the rajasthani context but it's important to understand that uh, craft is not of the past it's of the future because you're constantly creating for the future and you define what the future is through art uh and again like talking about the larger context of things uh, let me share my image sorry my screen so i can show you what i'm talking about specifically can you see this yes it's starting 
Yeah, so uh, this is the curb cycle, creativity cycle by Neri Oxman, uh, an amazing uh, profession in the field. If you want to look into her, they, they, you, I'm sure everybody would learn a lot. But since you talk about the intangible aspect, this is where the intangible aspect comes in. Why I started, and I'm grateful that you asked why is photography important first, is because of course, the tangible aspect, you will click pictures of your design, you will be able to market it, that is all tangible stuff, but it really comes down to the intangible as well in the longer run. So look, looking at this uh, image, we'll start with science. What, what it basically talks about is how all these four art, science, engineering and design are interconnected. So as we know, art is for expression, science is for exploration. Engineering is for innovation and design is for communication, right? And science converts uh, information into knowledge and engineering converts knowledge into utility. And that's where, you know, our materials and everything comes in as designers. Uh, des and design converts this utility into behavior, which is more of a cultural behavior, right? Because whatever our art is, that's what our Rajasthan again is a very beautiful example of this. Earlier, Rajasthan wasn't a single state. It was more than 50, 53 states. And they all were, you know, related or brothers in some sense or the other, at least the rulers, right? So how were they different? They were different through design, through their architecture, through their speech, through their art forms, through these kind of things. So they converted their utility into different kind of cultural behavior. And finally, art takes that cultural behavior to question our perception of the world. And that's where we come in, you know, like the design and the art aspect is interconnected to everything else that we see around us. So uh, as designers, I feel it's really important to understand why, where you are in the whole circle of things. It's not just about you designing your own little product at the corner. Uh, taking an example of a meme right now, uh, we all know that uh, during the COVID crisis, a lot of designers and a lot of memes came out where, uh, and this is a stereotype in the US, especially that most people are just doctors and things, right? So I saw this meme which said, uh, in an airplane, some emergency happened and the air hostess shouted, do we have a doctor in, in the plane? And then the next line was the father was nudging their kid and the kid was a designer. He wasn't a doctor like his father wanted him to be. So the dad goes like, why don't you save him as a PDF? And he goes like, not right now, dad. So the thing is, you might feel that in the larger context, you're just in your corner designing your product or whatever, but you must understand that in, in the larger context of things, you are really shaping everything else from the science to the engineering to the design aspect. And as artists, you are communicators. In fact, I feel like right now during this crisis, there aren't enough artists and you know like designers coming out with what you can really help with in, in all of the things that are happening around us so that's where i feel that the intangible aspect kicks in it's important the physical is always going to be there that's what we strive for that's what we work for but it's important to understand the intangible uh, heritage and intangible you know just the whole link of things that that goes behind everything that you do as designers or will be doing as designers that's very insightful you know Thank and you. Uh, during these past two years when a lot of things have been on standstill and the frontline workers have been doing their best to uh, you know keep all of us safe safe a lot of designers through different means have you know uh, engaged more on the social media now um not sure if the workflow is still as good as it would have been if the covid had not hit us but a lot of students a lot of designers young designers they have started you know working with different media and uh, they try to understand the client's requirement as well as their own philosophy of design and they try to take it forward so while we're talking about that uh, you know i uh, saw your Co chicago cola collection no, you have worked on a range of photographs. Right. So would you like to share that with us and uh, share your concept sure, behind that? So 
yeah before i share it just to tell you a bit about what why i made that series again being from rajasthan and a designer i love colors and this year in chicago we had a horrible winter and you couldn't step out anyway because of covid and there were no colors around us it was just uh, you know the white snow and the trees without any leaves on it so it was just black and white and i really missed home so i sort of created a series where i added colors a little too much colors to everything around on the photos uh so to show you how the picture was earlier it was like this uh this is the harrison hotel in chicago and behind it is the iconic sears building this building was the tallest building in the world for almost 20 years uh and still is the tallest building in chicago and what i did was i sort of took that and converted into a retro sort of design uh and made it into something like this because again like we don't have enough colors we don't have enough details to really look at when we step out in the cold and this series sort of came came from that uh, from you know like the mundane skies to something that is a little extra missing home and i sort of kept the theme around in this case it was i wanted to try something retro so i i called it chicago cola because it has the you know extra the red and the blue cola colors and that's the kind of retro vibe that i wanted to achieve but uh, yeah that's this is one example and then there was another one where i took uh, this building called aqua uh aqua building is again a very beautiful architectural monument in chicago known throughout the world actually if i can just show you some photos uh yeah so this is what the building looks like uh it it's these are balconies and then they also sort of stop the crazy winds that are blowing in chicago and then it also helps with the shading and stuff so i took this as an opportunity to you know play around with the colors as well to you know i took this palette and then i put it up there like that and then it sort of helped me with the branding of this uh, building as well i'll come to that eventually so again the major uh, point here is that don't think of photography as the end stop i did talk about photography as you know the marketability aspect of things but you can take things a notch further from there uh this is a branding that i did for this building because you know you from chicago and then i sort of remove one letter each and eventually it goes to go aqua because this building is aqua and it becomes a nice way to market the building things like that uh i'll come to my point once again and then there was this other example where the jaipur gherwa color as we know it this isn't exactly that but this is as close to it as i thought would look good again this building was its normal brick building but i converted it to the series color is is the actual color that we're talking about here so uh i guess the point here that you need to take away is that all the photography can do everything that i told you uh it can also help you think about the product that you design and you click uh it can help you think a step further than that it can help you add to it it can help you simplify even remove some things for it it can help you come up with the new ideas to be able to market your product because again as designers uh your idea is to communicate you are communicators at the end of it right so uh your product might just be bought by a single person in some you know artwork or some uh, in some sense but uh, at the end it's all about showing what you really mean and what your concept and idea was so yeah that's where i sort of did this uh, series and i cap captured these i had already captured these photos before the cold because i don't have the body or the inclination to step out in negative 20 degrees and yeah that this is where it helped me sort of relook at uh, how i could perceive the city and it eventually became a series that i liked myself i could say it's beautiful 
and you know we get to see that whatever we observe in our young age or childhood that stays with us forever something that gets embedded in our mind you know, and that always reflects in our design so uh, would you like when you're talking about the fundamentals of photography would you like to shed some light upon the basic aspects and you know because we have a lot of young designers with us today maybe with respect to right. the photographs that you have clicked or any other way uh I do have a presentation where I did the basics of photography and what you would need to know in terms of when you pick up a camera, what are the three things that you really need to know. It's a little technical, but I hope uh, you don't mind. And of course, I'm sure most of you have studied photography, but this will help you with it again. I have a presentation that I could share for this. Uh, Yeah, so I guess we could start from here in some essence. It's sorry, it's stuck. I just kind of added one slide to it, but uh, yeah, before we come to the technical aspects of uh, why you need to know these things, is because again, taking architecture as an example, because this presentation was made for architecture photography. But the thing is, while you don't have to be uh, actually trained in architecture, you should be familiar with the basic concepts and terminology of the field, as well as the history of major styles when you're doing architecture photography. And the same goes for, you know, design or product photography, or whatever you're designing and you want to click that. Because the idea is if you have designed a product where uh, a product has linear lines, straight lines, then you would want that product to show linear and straight lines in the, uh, you know, photo itself. It shouldn't be skewed. How uh, you look at a building from, you know, uh, your uh, street level, you see all the buildings sort of leaning back, but that shouldn't be the case because the architect wanted the building. He designed the building with everything linear. So it's the same, same logic of architectural photography trickling down to you know, product photography of your whatever product that you design. Uh, and the idea is just like, it's it's important that uh, just, a, just as a good sports photographer should understand the sports that they cover, it's a plus for architectural photographers to understand and sort of relate to the general concepts of design and architecture to bring their unique talents into the genre itself. Uh, so I'll just run you through the basics of uh, photography in the next 10 minutes or so. And before I begin, I usually like to talk about this principle, which is extremely relevant for designers. It's called the Pareto principle. Uh, the Pareto principle basically talks about that to achieve 80% of uh, the, the result, you need 20% of the effort to come in, right? So this happens a lot as designers, you would understand if there is group work, hai, so if there are five group, then there are one or two people who do more work. At least the feeling is that only one or two people are working from the group. But overall, the point here is that to achieve 80% of the results, you only need 20% of the effort. And what I'm, what I'm about to tell you about photography, if you understand just these uh, three principles, which is just 20% of photography, you will be able to capture photo like you know do good photography that is about 80 percent of the result so photography is all about three things mainly iso shutter speed and aperture uh and we'll start with iso uh iso is basically pretty much the first thing you should set in any given scenario uh it is the sensitivity of your camera sensor so the higher the number if you see this arrow it will show you that higher the number, the more sensitive your camera is going to be towards light. And the lower the number, the less sensitive. And so why not shoot the ISO as high as possible to get all the light in because you lose quality. Again, taking this example, uh, I shot this image originally at uh, 400 ISO, but there was actually not much light. So I tried to scale it up by increasing the ISO, but I'm not sure if you can see, but at 25,000 ISO, it has a lot of grains on it. And 
if it has grains then you're losing quality in the image and because i this was a raw image and i could really stretch it to extreme ends and it was of a decent quality in in the sense that the things were in focus and the image size was correct that's why i could you know make this into an art piece where i could really change the colors and pull them to extreme ends but if you see here the reds around the tree they pretty washed out now i could say that this is the aesthetic that i wanted to achieve but it really wasn't honestly but it goes well still but i could do this because uh, the image quality in itself was pretty clear so higher iso the more grain and the more noise comes into your photos okay also iso is one of the bigger reasons that camera that a camera's body price fluctuates uh, cheaper cameras can go up to say 800 or 1600 iso uh, before getting grainy uh, while in the more expensive cameras uh, isos can go up to 10000 before getting uh, quite grainy even in your phones you can control iso these days so you should try to play around with them so essentially in photography you basically pay more for light right because that's all that's it's really about a quick recap it's the sensitivity of your camera sensor and ideally you should try to keep it as low as possible to if, to have some you know general rule of thumb uh, if you're outdoors you sh- your iso shouldn't cross 100 if you're in shade in with the sun outside then your iso should be 200 to 400 and if you're doing interiors interior photography or product photography inside then your iso usually ranges from 400 to 600 to even 3200 depending upon how good your camera and its sensor is uh but yeah just again to keep it as simple as possible always try to keep your iso as low as possible to have the highest quality then the second thing is uh, shutter speed it's as simple as the name suggests it's the speed of the shutter at which it opens and closes it is measured in time usually seconds uh so you'll see numbers like you know 1 by 30 1 by 15 that is 1/15th of a second 1/30th of a second 1/60th of a second it can go up to 1/8000th of a second uh and this is basically how long your shutter is open inside the camera so the longer it is open the more light and details it's going to capture and shutter speed is sort of used in a uh, different sort of mid like 1 is to 8000 I'll, i'll actually show you some examples here like this is a sports photograph right so it was shot with the keeper mid air because the shutter opened and closed within a time span of 1 by 4000th of a second that's why you see everything is frozen there's no movement around and uh, yeah the camera opened and shut within 1/4000th of a second so that's extremely fast right uh another example is you must have seen these kind of photos where the water looks like smoke how is that achieved that is achieved because the shutter is kept open in this case i would assume that it's roughly from like you know 2 to 8 seconds that's why i wrote like maybe 4 seconds so what's happening here is that your shutter is open for 4 seconds so the water that is traveling from the top to the bottom of the waterfall or however long however much it travels in 4 seconds gets captured continuously so instead of you know the frozen water like if you had shot this at 1 by 4000 and the light was sufficient you would have captured water as it is perfectly still but because you chose to play with the shutter speed you can capture this smoke sort of moment and you can stretch it to the other extreme also where you know people capture stars and these kind of things where they keep the shutter open for minutes sometimes hours even for in a lot of cases and in this case this photo was probably taken with uh, a shutter speed of 180 seconds or so that's why what's happening is in within 180 seconds every light source that your camera is looking at like these stars is amplified again and again and again so every second that light is amplifying slowly again and again and again so even the smallest of light sources could become you know as bright as these stars that you see here so this is where shutter speed comes in so keep your iso as low as possible and your shutter speed relevant to whatever subject you're trying to click again a quick recap it's the amount of time your shutter will stay open longer it is open more light and vice versa so if you have if you step out in the sun and uh, 
you your shutter is open for even a second then the photos are going to be come out extremely white if at all like you probably won't have any detail in it because within a second if you're out in the sun then that light that natural light gets amplified extremely so it also controls motion blur as i showed you with the goalkeeper and the water uh some tips that you could use again these are pretty subjective it depends where you are how much light it is what you're clicking but uh, if you're new to it or you don't really click uh, on manual mode then you could experiment with these things so if you're clicking sports or you know fast subjects then you would go from 1 by 800th of a second to 1 by 8000th of a second uh for portraits uh, you want your subject to not move but capture the sort of natural light around so we usually play around 1 by 100th of a second to 1 by 800th of a second and then if you've seen you know on the street the light trails that people have you see the red lights and the white lights continuously on the streets or if you want to paint with light people paint all sorts of stuff with lights because they keep the shutter open for 30 seconds and more so whatever however you move the light it's going to come in your photo as a light trail so that's where you shoot your shutter to multiple seconds and lastly it's aperture aperture is extremely important but of course it seems tricky uh for i told you that i've been shooting since a very young age but i did not understand for the longest time because this is something that photographers have made complicated for no reason at all and jab tak designers or photographers koi cheez ko complicated na banaye jab tak how will they feel superior wali cheez hai but it's actually extremely simple and there is some math and technicality behind it but all you need to understand about aperture is that it's the size of the opening in your lens so opening could vary but it's about if you if your size of the opening is say for example 4 in this case then we kitni der tak that is open would be shutter speed and how much light we want to uh, capture is iso but aperture is basically once again coming to the size of the opening in your lens the lens has these blades in, uh, inside it to create a smaller or larger hole and this is uh, the part of the camera which is also called the iris it's similar to our eyes you know if we step into light our eyes ka jo iris is it, it gets smaller if we come into dark spaces then it gets bigger to be able to capture more light and see right if you have a friend that has you know light colored eyes you can experiment with them but uh, yeah so that's what it is aperture is where things could get a little tricky but the idea is simple that if the lower the number the more opening there is the higher the number the lesser opening there is okay so that's all you need to really remember this is the lesser important thing about eyes uh, sorry aperture but uh, it's just the inverse so the smaller the number higher the opening but where do we really use it is this uh if you see that the iso uh, sorry aperture is 2.8 you see that the background is completely blurred out right so when you're clicking a portrait like in this example this thing and you want the background to be blurred so your emphasis is on the person or your product say uh then you want the background blurred so emphasis is just on your product so you you would use lower uh, aperture and when you're clicking say multiple objects at different depths you would move between 5.6 to 8 to be able to capture things to thoda aage piche bhi ho and if you're clicking landscapes where there's a tree in front mountain at the back sun at the back and things at extremely different levels and distances then you would uh, shoot your aperture all the way to higher numbers so aperture is the size of the opening in the lens uh lower the f stop so f stop is basically how we read it so f slash number is called f stop lower the f stop more light higher the f stop less light and how they work is pretty simple honestly you don't need to get too confused that how do i know what number is where they basically double so alternatively they double it usually starts with 1 and then 1.4 so 1 alternatively would be double to 2 alternatively double to 4 8 16 32 etc right and this would go from 1.4 to 2.8 to 5.6 to uh, 11 to 22 and so on and so forth uh initially if 2. Point, like did the, these could vary from camera to camera but this is how it basically works so if you can sort of understand that uh 
lower the number more it opens then that way you can control the field of depth and controlling field of depth is one place where i would say the difference between an amateur and a professional comes in and if you're already controlling the field of depth then you're doing photography at a higher level compared to most people how they do it and especially as designers i would say uh, that it's extremely important to control field of depth to be able to you know put your product against a background like say example for example you're clicking something that is based on jaipur city concept and you're clicking in the city then you might not want to show the city in too much detail but just blurred enough to sh- be able to signify that it, it is the city behind you so you could then again play around with the aperture itself uh yeah so this was a bit of the technical aspect of how to control the light and balance out the camera ka settings thanks a lot for sharing this with us i'm sure it uh, students would find it very helpful because you know we are we try to relate all of these things together when we interpret a design and materialize it so um right. i'll just have one more question for you and then we would be op- open for questions from our audience if anybody would like sure. to ask anything they might they may please type it in the chat box so uh, just the next thing that i was curious about is your uh, this versus that series this is a series that right. you have developed no so would you like to share that with us and talk about it sure. origin so this was is that series was again something that i would urge you guys as designers to think of it as an example to relate to in the sense that whatever you doing think of the larger perspective and the larger context i don't necessarily mean the uh circle of the the curves creativity circle i mean wh- wh- whatever product that you create today you might need to create something similar years down the line or basically you can make a series out of things that you something that you do right now you could do again in the future and this is where this versus that series sort of came into existence for me uh, i'll start with the first picture that i clicked when i came to chicago uh, sorry Second. Yeah, can you see the image? Might take a second. Yeah, it's loading now. Yeah, so uh, this this versus that series is basically an architecture photography series that I shot, and the idea was Chicago is from the Indian context. It's pretty young. it's only 100 150 years old but it has so much of architectural heritage and so much of difference in its uh, architectural styles materials philosophies and this is where chicago is actually the center of where uh, modern architecture really began this is where skyscrapers began this is where uh, all the innovation in building technology began and you can really see that difference uh, to date in everywhere you walk around especially in the especially in the sort of uh, context of the downtown neighborhood so when i came here this was the first photo that i took and this was taken in somewhere august late august 2019 and i really related to this photo because i felt the same thing i was pretty confused like you know what really is happening there's so much i i'm a trained architect of course i'm just very young into the field and there's so much to learn but even being a trained architect i was completely lost in the city so i try to sort of compare one style to the other not putting one against the other but just to learn what was different then and what was different now so this was the first sort of photo and this gave me the idea to connect it to a series later and the rest of the photos i clicked in say early 2021 and late 2020 even but i'll start from the beginning now actually so the idea is just to juxtapose it to I'll, yeah just so exposing different architectural styles and mediums so if you see this white building in the middle this is by uh, a very famous uh, architect louis sullivan who is often called the father of skyscrapers so chicago is the city of skyscrapers too of course new york is the as we know it the real city of skyscrapers because in new york everything is done to a larger scale 
but a lot of the building innovation actually came from Chicago in itself. And what I did was I wanted to capture this white building and its architectural details. And if you remember, I told you, if you're designing a product, uh, yeah, just another, again, the disclaimer, remember if I'm talking about architecture, it does trickle down to your designer or products, small scale products as well, because this this uh, architect design, you know, the linear lines, straight lines, I wanted to capture it the same way as well. So I, I could have shot the building from, you know, right below the building itself. And that's where I started. And then I realized just behind it, there's a black building, which really juxtaposes it and makes a nice contrast between the two. And also this is the past and this is the future in a lot of ways, because this building was built, I think 40 years ago, and this is from the twenties or thirties, I could be wrong, but it's, it's nearly a hundred years old. Uh, and yeah, so this is again, one thing, uh, another thing to learn from this would be that a good photographers know the good photographers know where to stand. And this is one example where I feel like I outdid myself because I started 405 meters, 400 or 500 meters ahead. And then I came all the way back to be able to find this sort of, you know, photo with movement in the train and this sort of uh, contrast with the black and the white and this sort of aspect. And of course, it doesn't show too much of the building in itself, but I feel it shows enough to be able to have a direct comparison. Uh, in the sense, if you see these small windows, these this, the same proportion is used in the building that came much later behind it. And Chicago is a city where light is scarce and we only have the sun for a couple of months, honestly. And I'm, I can't wait for the summer to come. Uh, so that's why they have like these big, you know, square windows here in some sense. Another example of, you know, the old uh, architecture versus new comparing the two with I could have easily cut these things out and this is what I usually do in the Indian context. We sort of consider the wires and, you know, the monkeys or whatever is so much is happening around. We sort of cut it out, but I kept it here for, for a reason because it shows a lot. Like these things do exist. They are still part of the surrounding that exists around us. So I sort of made it a part of it and it talks about, you know, what time and era we're in. Uh, this is again something that I really like. This this building is uh, a postmodernistic building, and it was a little sort of a challenge to the straight lines and straight buildings that existed in the early modernism era. It is a modern building with perfectly straight lines, and this has you know curvilinear lines. And I guess you would have seen this photo in the poster as well for today's talk. And again, the same thing, this building, this is called the Marina building. Uh, and postmodernistic buildings usually try to challenge the linear lines that are there a lot. So I thought that these two buildings being next to each other makes a very good contrast and talks a lot about the city. Uh, just one more example that I would share is this, uh, of course, because uh, if you remember, I showed you the Sears Star, which is the which was the tallest building in the world and is the icon of Chicago. Uh, this building in itself that you see is by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, who is one of he, he was the father of you could say modernism in the sense like minimalism and all those things. So all these buildings that you see today, with you know a rigid grid, came from uh, one of the people that really designed it was uh, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. And this building is, these three buildings, all of them are his. And uh, this lower building is the post office, which I feel is a very beautiful thing to do because post office is something that should be approachable and post office belongs to everybody. So that's why he decided to make this just, you know, of a single floor. Of course, it's pretty high. It has high ceiling, about 20, 30 feet. But it's, it feels approachable because that's what a post office should be. And I sort of tried to relate to the architectural style that he had showing the front elevation somewhat of the side because it's the same in both of these and sort of show the reflection of Chicago's icon that the Sears building is. But yeah, in essence, I would say that I clicked the first photo years and years ago, but I sort of connected it to a larger context and that's what photography can sort of help you. Like I clicked this way before and years later when I clicked, I think it was this photo that I clicked. 
uh, early 2020 and then I realized that I could make a series out of it. And that's what I would urge you designers to do as well because whatever you do, don't think that it's going to end with that project in itself. You're constantly learning and you can always relate it to something a lot bigger than whatever you might be doing at the time. It's brilliant, you know, it's simply amazing how you have, you know, captured the different moods also, I would say, moods of the designers and the architects, how they plan those things. And the constructions are years apart from each other and, you know, it takes, I think, experience and that observation also to notice those details because we pass a lot of such things in our daily life and many of us just don't notice it or sometimes some things that we find very interesting and uh, feel like noticing, but then we don't have a camera. But luckily, everybody has a camera these days with on their phone. But uh, I'm sure the effect is entirely different when you are using a professional mode. And you know, like Director Ma'am and Minakshi Ma'am have shared here, and I totally agree. You are a brilliant teacher, and I'm sure your students would also be benefiting a Thank lot. Thank you so much. And so our audience no, I really as well. appreciate that. Our audience no, but as I, well. if you don't mind, I would. Uh, remind everybody that you don't need to be a photographer this is one point that i raised back in the early presentation that you don't need to pull out your camera if you just sort of make photography and understand photography and make it a habit in some sense like even if you're doing it once a week twice a week just do it for a year i would say you don't even have to do it continuously then you will train your eyes to notice these things all around you and you don't always need a camera, I would say. Like a lot of people, like in the last presentation I did, somebody asked me a very good question, which was, uh, how do we start photography or when should we start photography? It was something along those lines. And I told them that, you know, your eyes are all, already doing the job for you. You just need to know the principles behind it. And as designers, you already do know the principles. Uh, I actually forgot to go ahead in that presentation, but there were some principles about, you know, what photography, how it should be done, but all designers know that, you know, things like balance, rule of thirds, vertical lines being verticals, contrast, symmetry, asymmetry. You guys already know that. It's just about being able to convert it into, you know, the outside or scale it down all the way to your product. So never think that I don't have a good camera or I don't have something that would be you know would put you behind compared to others because art in general you sort of uh, you know craft is about the alchemy of materials i would say in a lot of sense uh, but you cannot be impaired by or feel handicapped by you know the machine versus the hand product or you know i don't know this software or i don't know this technique because there's always ways around it and you could sell it, honestly. It's, at the end, it's all about the concept. I think yesterday when we were having our talk, we spoke about the example of the white canvas. A lot of famous paintings in the world are just pretty much blank white canvas or on white paint on white canvas. Why is that? And it's not that those paintings aren't great in technicality. That's something I learned pretty recently. But at the end, it's all about creating a story and be able to connect to that larger context of things. And as long as you're doing that, as long as your eyes are doing that in the context that you're in, uh, you would be able to sort of create that unique niche for yourself. And another example, sorry, just I'll take one more minute. Uh, one thing that I tell my students a lot, and it would be extremely relevant for the students here as well, is that we're designers and we would constantly feel that we don't know enough or there's so much more to learn. In fact, this is the feeling that you should grow up with. If you're feeling that I have mastered my field, then you're probably doing something wrong because there will always be somebody better than you in some sense or the other, because the context might change, the client might change so much. There's so much happening all around it, right? And there would always be somebody better than you. I'm taking this example where, say if I take, if there's 25 students in a class and I ask you to do a sketch of the interior of a room, all 25 of you may be able to do it because you guys know one point, two point perspective, right? But out of the 25 people, only 10 kids would really design the table, the legs of the table in that room or look at design the light properly in that room or design a different sort of light, right? 
only five students out of those 25 would go to the detail of putting a glass of water on the table or putting you know life size things on the table only two or three students then would go to that level of noticing the electric sockets or the plug points within that sketch and your objective and idea and aim should be to that final one student if at all to be the person that can notice the detail of the cobweb or the spider web in the corner of the room so design is not so much about the technicality or the material or you know the type of camera you have it's all about finding that unique angle for yourself and it doesn't take a lot to be able to design or sketch that little cobweb it's it's all about that detail that you thought about and photography can really help you in this level even if it doesn't matter what kind kind of designer you are but at least it helped me and i'm pretty confident that it could help anybody to look for that level of detail i think we have some questions we have a lot of lots of compliments for you in the chat box <laughs> <laughs> no, i really appreciate it i'm i'm glad i this could be useful and there's a question also uh, like uh, i would just go to the question please uh, bharti is asking please tell what quality good professional photographer must possess uh a lot of it is the same as you know what a design professional should possess uh, you need to be i would say for photography you need to be persistent because uh, again like when you should do photography is all the time uh, no building is the same at if you go click a building at 6 in the morning it's not going to be the same at 12 in the morning it's not going to be the same at 3 in the morning or afternoon or whatever right so persistence is extremely important like i said i did not step out in the cold winter my roommate who's a great photographer he stepped out in negative 20 negative 30 degrees and you know shot photos and did everything and i feel like that really helps you that sort of persistence is what shows you the different angles and you know times and things that you would usually ignore so yeah you just have to keep at it it's it's a cliche in the field practice does make you perfect uh but yeah quick reminder nothing nobody is ever perfect because like i just shared that example of that cobweb wala cheese uh so persistence would be one the second is and this is a double edged sword it's a good thing and a bad thing because main to thak jata hu main jab bhi koi bahar dekhta hu i'm constantly judging things ke yaar ye cheez idhar kyun hai aise kyun hai and sometimes wish ke rest kar lo yaar theek hai hai jaisi hai rehne do but uh, this is another thing like if you if you're a photographer you should notice everything around you it comes like it's it's a uh, two way thing like if you train yourself to be a photographer you will start noticing if you start noticing you your training gets better in itself too so just look around don't look at your phone i do i also battle with this problem that's another issue i would say uh baki don't be limited by your hardware uh, i would say theek hai you should invest in it i would say the, remember the pareto principle like even if you have a phone camera you can achieve 80% of the results but that finer 20% that finer you know the example i did of the students for that you do need to get the better quality cameras and all of those things but that comes later any other questions i hope that answered the question yeah i'm sure you have covered almost everything uh for people to understand the concept behind it and not uh, and rest i think is up to the person who would like to you know pursue it further or whoever is interested and how they want to perceive things you know it depends a lot like you said about the art piece white canvases it talks less about the artist and more about the person who is looking at the canvas that's why they sell for millions so i think it goes uh, in a similar manner with the photographer and photographs also and how you observe things right i completely agree and yeah it, so it's it, at the end it has to sell to that one person that's paying those millions and if they connect to it your job is done in some sense 
there's another question how to think of a mood for a raw image when we click an image like color toning and all uh well that's pretty subjective again i would say but uh, as for a designer it's extremely important to be true to the colors because if you're clicking a product or a building then if the architect or designer wanted that product to be of a specific red right like i did a series that chicago cola or this uh, this series color the pink the specific pink of say jaipur also uh if you're clicking that then you want the colors to be as natural and as direct as they are because that's how the architect or the uh, you know designer wanted it so in photography this is a mistake that we often make we sort of change the colors and things of things that shouldn't be changed in some sense of course if you're doing photography like i i showed you those images i changed things entirely but that's then that's not photography anymore that's that's more of an art sort of piece in some sense but if since you're talking about raw image and color toning i would the first thing that you should do is always check that your colors are being true to its nature uh white uh, color balancing and your white balance becomes very important in case you don't know how white balance works i would re- recommend that look it up other people can explain it better than i do with the equipment that you have specifically so you'll understand it better but uh, yeah mostly i would say just be true to the colors that really exist and you also have to think that your camera firstly alters the colors from what might exist unless you really you know set the colors perfectly captured them in the perfect light secondly when you see it in your screen it's going to look different because usually our screens are somewhere between 30% to 70% uh, color corrected uh, color accurate at least uh, in my case i have uh, bought a 100% color accuracy screen just for that fact because when i'm clicking photos or designing something i see the exact color that was intended so on site the client or you know my colleagues or others don't say jo aapne yellow bataya tha wo to ye yellow hai nahi so you have to think about those mediums as well if you're putting it on instagram your picture is going if your raw image might be 25 mb but when you're posting it on instagram it might go down to a few kbs like 100 kb 200 kb so you need to think about those aspects as well i hope that answers your question more uh how did you get the building lines parallel to the frame is it just standing further at in altitude to keep your camera perpendicular to the face of the building or do you have to skew it further during the post processing that's an extremely good question and this is something that i missed when you're doing architectural photography the one rule forget everything i said jo bhi maine sikha hai agar tum sab kuch bhi bhul jao sirf ye cheez yaad rakho ki your camera ka body the back of the camera should be straight never put your camera at an angle right and now you might think if i'm putting it straight how will i capture the whole building one way is to of course do it in post processing uh or step out sorry step back and capture the whole building but if you're clicking uh with your camera vertically sorry the back of the camera vertically to the building then this problem will go away and otherwise what you can do is click the base of it and then thoda sa shoot up and then stitch those two photos together and in post processing you can do it i can show you guys a quick relevant uh, example if you want this might take a couple of minutes though but yeah so one way is to step back and the second way is post processing and if you go into post processing if you guys know for i'm sure you guys know photoshop if or lightroom or something or the others there's a uh, a part called geometry in it and in that you need to you can sort of skew things uh in some sense that's why it's also important to sort of zoom out uh, in an image so in post processing when you're skewing things or changing uh, correcting the perspective some of the part gets cropped out i'll show you some example yeah so this is one building that is click niche se and you can tell that the building seems to be sort of falling backwards now this is not maybe the person intended it to be like this but in terms of architectural photography principles this is wrong so in photoshop or lightroom or however whatever you use how you can change it is uh 
sorry wait so i go to filter and camera off there's other ways to do this as well and you can look it up but i'm showing you one of the easiest ways that i use uh, if you're clicking in draw image this will directly open when just as soon as you take your photo into photoshop this camera raw filter opens up and within geometry here uh there's all these settings but you don't need to confuse yourself i just use the guided and what guided does is i'll just draw these guidelines this is supposed to be straight and this is supposed to be straight uh we're not able to see the guidelines i'm not sure if others are also able to see oh okay uh in, oh you couldn't see these guidelines no maybe you presented the tab that's why oh okay. you presented the whole uh, screen then we might yeah yeah, yeah. let let me do that thank you for pointing that out uh present now my screen so i go to acha okay so you might have not seen the camera raw filter so i go to filter and camera raw filter and within camera raw filter i go to geometry is this visible yes yes and then in this i go to guided now there's one simple way is vertical it does work most of the times like it made the lines vertical in itself but like i said you need to sort of zoom out and click because you lose part of the image that's that's an important lesson in uh, you know architectural photography but i usually use guided because you have more control in it and it's almost just as easy so i'll click one side and i know that this is supposed to be a straight line so this is one side fixed and then this is supposed to be a straight line right and then i achieve this it's pretty similar to the vertical in some sense but it doesn't always work and then i can scale it up and then i have my image corrected right so this is one way to do it but of course you should always try to step back if you remember i said a good photographer knows where to stand when clicking the photo so that makes all the difference a lot of times too uh for architectural photography would you prefer tilt shift lens or fish eye see that's again tilt shift uh lenses is used to do exactly what i said like uh, if you can't go all the way back then tilt shift lenses can help you sort of click upar niche while keeping the back of your camera uh, perpendicular to the building or straight uh, i would personally prefer tilt shift because fish eye sort of skews the edges around the thing but it depends it's it's really subjective i i would prefer fish eye or a uh, wide angle lens for interior to be able to capture the depth of the room uh, and for outside i would prefer a tilt shift lens so i can sort of you know keep that vertical again if you guys don't know what tilt shift lens is it's basically a lens that can move on the mount of the camera so uh, what happens is let me see if i can find a relevant example we can of course i would recommend you to try it out and sort of look online but uh, this is what tilt shift lenses achieve so this is what it looks like you can move your camera up and down on this mount here and this is how the photo is usually taken but with tilt shift you put your camera perpendicular to this building and then you first capture itta part and then you shift your lens above and it captures the second half too it only moves a couple millimeters here but in your camera itself it moves a lot so that's how you can capture the whole building but this is again something that costs a lot of money and you don't need to start from here if you just you know step back or do post processing you can control these things quite easily uh could you please provide few tips for product photography honestly everything that i said right now is relevant for product photography as well but since product is smaller you have the power to create your own light so lighting is extremely important and uh, your product uh, so like if you remember what i said your color should be true so if you're using a light don't use a yellow light that might you know change the colors that are coming on to the product unless you want it that way of course like if it's an interior product which is meant for a warm interior then you could do that 
Uh, but again, it's pretty subjective. But everything I told you, even this, if if your product is linear, then make sure that all the lines and everything that you're seeing in it is linear. If you have designed a vase, for example, and it it has an ellipse, then don't click it at an angle where the ellipse seems skewed or the ellipse is looking like a circle in some sense. So just try to be true to the form, shape, light, colors, and everything of the product in itself. Uh, and again, if you have a very small product, then there are these small studio thingies that come on Amazon that you could buy, which has a little background on it, backdrop on it, and has a light in itself. That's how I do my jewelry photography or these other things where a product has you know perfect white balanced light over it. So everything that I told you about architectural photography, use it as a euphemism for product photography because those laws. are the same in design all throughout that's why i am not a great ui ux person but because i know the basics of design i can do architecture i can at least try to do graphic design try to do other things so it kind of works like that thank you so much thank you so much for sharing your information this has been a very interesting I conversation think. and a lot of learning has happened in the process as well I hope so. Thank so, you so much. I can, <laughs> uh, have any question, uh, please reach out. Yeah. We should we had planned for a one hour session, but it has been so uh, you know capturing as well <laughs> that we have gone on with the conversation and a lot of our audience have had questions and things. Uh, if anybody Thank has questions, he has shared his email ID. You may have, you can reach out to him. And, you know, yeah, thanks for email. taking out time. Yeah, you can find me on Instagram or whatever it is easy for you. Thank you so much. You know, that's the least I can do. Of yeah, course. Hopefully and I would suggest to. Yeah, I would also suggest to the students to look at up his Behance profile. All his work is also there and on his Insta page. Right, I need to update that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thanks a lot for. Uh, thank you so much. You know, taking out time for the session, and we really look forward to collaborating again sometime in future. Thank you. I hope so too. Yeah. Thank you so much. I would much. also like to Great thank day. Secretary Sir for you know introducing you to us and so that we could have this session. Thank you, Sir. How <laughs> wonderful! <laughs> it's it's the least thank I you. can. Thank you. Thank you, Sati. Thank you. Thank you, Datta. Acha ra. So, so Sir, Sir, you explain everything very well. Thank you. <laughs> thank you everyone for joining us today or uh, we wish you all the best sanjay thank you so much i wish the same for all the students and you of course and of yeah. course the recording as anything yeah the recording for the session will be available on our facebook and youtube pages very soon so those who might have missed a few things in the beginning might uh, have a look there and okay so all of you stay safe be healthy and we'll see you again next week with another water session okay so thank you everyone take care bye bye